Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for braving the heat on this beautiful July Wednesday. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the Two Mississippi Museums for History is Lunch. I'm Chris Goodwin. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. Don't forget, you can sign up for a weekly email to stay current on what's going on with the History's Lunch series and other things with the department. And over by the email sign-up sheet, you will also see the first new rack cards for the book festival um, with some big names, including uh, Supreme Court Justice Sudja Sotomayor for this year. So pick that up and see who all is on the tap for that. Uh, I note with sadness the deaths of architect Phil Freelon and historian, historian David Sansing. Although his health prevented Freeland from participating in our series directly, last year we featured a video interview with him here on site discussing his ideas as reflected in the facade of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, which he designed, along with, of course, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And David Sansing was a beloved teacher and author who gave his final History's Lunch program last year on his epic book of Mississippi Governors. Sansing was interested in all aspects of Mississippi history. He shaped many minds in his college classes and was a friend to many across the state. Tomorrow, the Museum of Mississippi History will have the inaugural History Happy Hour from 5 to 7 p.m. The Lucky Hand Blues Band will perform. There'll be a cash bar, free eats, and flash tours highlighting alcohol and Prohibition-era artifacts in the museum. If that doesn't sound like fun, I don't know what to do. On Friday, at 11 a.m., the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will have the next installment of Freedom Song Friday, this time featuring Canton civil rights veteran Flonzy Brown Wright. So I hope we'll see you for those. And finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Timothy Smith will be with us to present The Real Horse Soldiers, Benjamin Grierson's epic 1863 Civil War raid through Mississippi. Today, we are delighted to have Katie McKee presenting Mississippi in the work of Sherwood Bonner. Katie McKee is director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and McMullen Professor of Southern Studies and Professor of English at the University of Mississippi. She earned her BA from Center College in Danville, Kentucky, and her MA and PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's co-editor of American Cinema and the Southern Imaginary, and her new book is Reading Reconstruction, Sherwood Bonner and the Literature of the Post-Civil War South. Help me welcome Katie McKee. Good morning. So there's a happy hour? How come I didn't get invited to talk of that, Chris? That seems like that would be fun. Hmm. But lunch is good, too. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I really appreciate the invitation, Chris, to come down. My husband and I came down a day early and went through the museum yesterday. That is something that we had not done yet and found them to be really powerful. Um, and, and really important to the kind of work that I hope that this book does in teaching people, showing people something about the history of Mississippi. I did do uh, some work down here in the archives when I was working on this project, and although not much of that work ultimately ended up in the book, I did have a chance to, to use the facilities and uh, really appreciate all of the things that the archives and history make possible for all of us in this state and people all over the, the country and the world. So I bring you greetings from the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. I hope sometime you will come to see us and enjoy some of our programming. I can't say more than that right now. I've been on the job for um, 10 days. Uh, last And last week we worked three days and then we were off two days for the 4th of July. <laughs> And this week, I went to work on Monday, and then John and I came down here. So, so far, it's going pretty well. <laughs> I might have to go to work all week next week. So I'm going to try to do four things today. The first thing I want to do is give you just a quick overview of the argument of this book that I have written called Reading Reconstruction. The second thing I want to do is introduce you to Sherwood Bonner as a person. I think you could live a really good long life and never have heard of Sherwood Bonner. So I want to introduce you to her today as a person. Then the third thing I want to do is introduce you to her as a writer. And that is why you have a handout with some passages. 
At this point in the talk, we might veer a little bit toward the classroom, so I won't be calling on you, but uh, there will be room for you to be reading and thinking about what we're talking about. And then at the end, I'd like to read just the last, if we have time, I'll read just the last few pages, or the first few pages of the book as a way of summarizing some of the main points, both of the book and of the talk today. Okay? That sound all right? Okay. So the book that I'm working on takes sure that I have finished now. I'm so used to saying that I'm working on it that I'm forgetting to put that in the past tense. The book that I worked on is called Reading Reconstruction, Sherwood Bonner and the Literature of the Post-Civil War South. I had three main objectives in composing this book. The first was to take Sherwood Bonner seriously as a writer, the role to which she most wanted to lay claim. Now, I did not discover Sherwood Bonner. There is work out there about her. Most importantly, this book in the middle of the screen, which is a biography of Sherwood Bonner that was written by Hubert McAlexander. Hubert McAlexander is a professor emeritus of English at the University of Georgia. He is from Holly Springs, Mississippi, and he was able to use the fact that he is from there to make all kinds of connections and get access to all kinds of papers, things that, that have just kind of disappeared into the world. So that biography, despite the fact that it is several decades old now, is really the main source about Sherwood Bonner. And as I said to Dr. McAlexander when I visited with him, without this biography, no work on Sherwood Bonner would be possible at all. It would not be possible to study her. This is still a compelling outline of her life. Then the purple cover over there on the other side of the screen is a compilation, a kind of anthology of her work that was done as a dissertation and then turned into a book by a PhD student at the University of Mississippi named Ann Gowdy. This brings into print and makes accessible lots of work that otherwise we would not be able to read. And then a historian named Jane Turner Censor brought back into print on the University of South Carolina Press, Like Unto Like, which is the one novel that Sherwood Bonner published in her lifetime. So all of this work is out there. But the truth is that people's conversations about Sherwood Bonner, even in scholarly circles, have been dominated by talking about her personality. As you will see, when we are introduced to her here in a few minutes, she led a life that challenged a lot of the norms for her time. And people got busy talking about <clears throat> the things she got up to when she left home. They got busy talking about her romances, who they were with and who they might have been with and what her husband thought about them. So people got busy thinking about those kinds of things. But of, of all the different things she tried in her life, the thing that Sherwood Bonner wanted to do was be a writer. She wanted people to take her seriously as a writer. And that is what I have tried to do in this book. So there is some biography that is mixed in there, but most of the time I have come at Sherwood Bonner's work as an English professor. I have treated it as literature that is worthy of careful consideration. And I hope that she would appreciate that. The second thing I was trying to do was take this single life and look at the complexity of the post-Civil War world through this individual life that was lived in a series of places. Holly Springs, she went to Boston, she went to other places in the Northeast, she went to Europe. And I was trying to think about what the post-Civil War world looked like to this individual. And by looking at the world through the eyes of that individual, think about how her experiences might have been alike or similar, similar to or different from other people's. The thing that I think we forget, but that, say, the exhibits in this museum make so clear, is that when Sherwood Bonner was alive in the 1870s, and the early 1880s, she really didn't know what was going to happen next. She really didn't know what the tumult of that kind of post-Civil War world was going to add up to. She was kind of trying to figure that out along with lots of other black and white Mississippians and black and white Americans. So we're, we, we, I kind of try in this book to take a step back and put myself into the indeterminacy of the moment that she also occupied and imagine what the world looked like to her from that vantage point. And then finally, here is a literary argument that Sherwood Bonner's work absorbs the tensions and the conflicts of this post-Civil War world, particularly around questions of race and gender, and, and struggles to contain them. 
So sometimes her fiction is kind of unwieldy. Sometimes her travel letters are hard to make sense of because I think she's trying to wrap her arms around all that indeterminacy of the post-Civil War world. Now, th this goes to that sort of question that students ask a lot. You know, they will say, uh, well, I mean, did Nathaniel Hawthorne really mean for the Scarlet Letter, though, to mean anything? And in that case, the answer is yes. <laughs> I think he really did. But <laughs> whether or not authors intend for their work to have the resonances that they do isn't always the most important question. Sometimes the most important question is how does work make meaning for readers? What do readers do with the things that they encounter? So I tried to think about how Bonner's work tries to put its arms around all of the questions that belong to that post-Civil War world and then think about how readers might have navigated those questions. So these are the three main ideas of the book. Now enough of that kind of luxury sort of thing. Let's talk for just a minute about Holly Springs, Mississippi. Probably there's somebody in here who's from Holly Springs. I bet lots of you have been to Holly Springs. It is an interesting place that is just a few miles away from Oxford, Mississippi, where I live. It is one of the most interesting places I know. And one of the reasons it is so interesting is if we go back to this late 19th century period and we look at the women who come out of Holly Springs. So here's an interesting book for someone who is not I to write. For example, Ida B. Wells is born in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And there is a, a great effort in Holly Springs right now to do more with the house that is currently serving as the Ida B. Wells Museum to uh, highlight more how the early years at Ida B. Wells, who went on to write in dramatic and riveting fashion about racial outrages and injustices in the post-Civil War period. How did those early years in Holly Springs shape who she turned out to be? Kate Freeman Clark is a painter that some of you may have been be familiar with. There is a gallery of her work in Holly Springs. She is her own interesting story that you can read about in Carolyn Brown's recent biography of her. But she also is from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Anne Walter Fern, who becomes a doctor and goes to be a doctor in China, is from Holly Springs, Mississippi. And she writes an autobiography in which she accounts rather briefly for her early years in Holly Springs, but then goes on to talk about all of the things that she sees and does as a woman in China who is a doctor at a time when women weren't much leaving home, much less going to China to be doctors. And then we have Sherwood Bonner. What's interesting to me is that, in fact, all of these women are alive at, at the same point. Now, some of, Bonner is the oldest, so they don't necessarily know each other, but members of their families know each other, and important things that touch the community of Holly Springs touch all of their lives. Everyone on these two slides, for example, is a, it has, loses someone in the yellow fever epidemic. The yellow fever epidemic in 1878 that claims the lives of Bonner's father and her brother also claims the lives of Ida B. Wells' parents, for example. So there are these moments where the lives of these women brush up against each other. And we have probably not yet thought enough about how Holly Springs acts as a container that makes it possible for these strong, powerful women to move beyond Holly Springs into the world and then in some cases come back to it. So that's a little note about just the interesting place of Holly Springs. Let's talk about Sherwood Bonner for a minute. <laughs> Catherine Sherwood Bonner McDowell called herself Sherwood Bonner as a writer, but that is her whole name. She was born in 1849 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. She lived the early years of her life out on a plantation in the county. We don't know much about those years, and then later she and her family moved to town. Apparently, all this hair you see going on over here, all this hair was kind of auburn colored and it attracted a lot of attention. And she knew that and she was happy to continue to draw attention to it and to herself. This is her father, rather a severe looking man. Charles Bonner was uh, a doctor. He was an Irish immigrant. He married into Mississippi money. And so that is how he came to have the, the land that he did and uh, sort of the social prominence that he did. 
he looks like a hard guy to tell something to you, you don't want to have to confess. And it's probably not an accident that in many of Bonner's stories, there are doctor figures. And usually these doctor figures lose their advantage. And they often lose their advantage to a female character in the story. So I, I, sus I suspect there is an element of biography there. This is their house that they lived in called Cedarhurst that was finished in 1857. Now, if you know Holly Springs, someone must. Someone knows Holly Springs. If you know Holly Springs, if you're going out Salem Avenue, this is one of those big houses that's there. These houses were being finished up in the 1850s. Most of them, many of them are still there, being finished up in the 1850s, and they are a sign of the wealth and prominence of people in this town. Holly Springs is a very wealthy community in the years before the Civil War, far more wealthy than Oxford, Mississippi, for example. In fact, one of the wealthiest places in the state of Mississippi. A lot of that wealth is coming from cotton. Um, Dr. Bonner is able to build out there because he has both the, the plantation and his practice as a doctor. This house is for sale right now if you're in the market for something. And you would be really surprised what you can get a, a big old antebellum house for in Holly Springs, Mississippi. I have been in this house and it's beautiful. So as a young woman, 20 years old, Sherwood Bonner imagines that she might become a writer and she imagines a world that extends beyond Holly Springs. So when she is 20, she gets a couple of stories published in a magazine called the Boston Plowman. So she is, she's not just trying to get in the Holly Springs Reporter, the local newspaper, she's imagining uh, a much larger national audience. Now, 1869, and this is on your handout, 1869 is significant to us for a couple of reasons. So there is Sherwood Bonner publishing something, but it's also significant to us because this is the one year from which we have a diary of Bonner's, a diary that Hubert McAlexander saw and fortunately published in full in a, in a journal so that we have access to it today. So I want to just look at these passages with you for a minute and sort of see what, what's on Sherwood Bonner's mind in 1869. You can follow along on your handout if you want. So on December the 1st, see if this sounds like someone who is 20 years old. On December the 1st, she says, wrote to Edward rather coldly, but never loved him better. I've thought much of my future and am determined unless I marry to carve out my own fortune. So notice that unless I marry, you've got two choices here, marrying or having a fortune. I have decided to be an actress <laughs> after hesitating for a long time in favor of a literary life. Next day, the next day, December the 2nd, I have a letter from Edward to Helen which inclines me to break our engagement. I had so much faith in his love, I do not think him false, but his love is not what I thought. So you say to yourself, good catch, Sherwood Bonner. <laughs> good catch. You're not, don't get hooked up with that guy. Two weeks later, December the 14th, this is what she writes in her journal. Since writing the above, further developments have induced me to forget and forgive, and we are even more tenderly united than before. She's talking about Edward. I must believe that I am totally without firmness of purpose, for I had almost solemnly determined to break off this engagement. If I had done so, I believe I would have been a better woman. I never would have married anyone. I'm sick of the subject and would have devoted my life to the attainment of some worthy object. But living as I do and as I will in the future is a sort of intermittent torture. The constant search after happiness, the unfailing disappointment, the discovery of the vileness of human nature, the impossibility of finding one congenial soul, the emptiness of the pleasure of the world. How, how can I endure all this? My heart sickens as I think of the years of life ahead of me. Could I be certain of annihilation, I would blot out my life tomorrow. My one hope is in Edward, but he would not understand these feelings. So we have the kind of vacillation that may be typical of young love early on. And we may have some of the drama that is typical of late adolescence when we get to this, this third entry. But I think we also see a kind of dark undercurrent of uh, instability, of restlessness in Bonner that will really be a part of her life going forward. And I think we, we know, those of us who are older than 20 in the room, 
I think that we know that to have all of your hope in a single person is probably not a good beginning to a relationship. So what, is, so what happens next? What does Bonner do? <clears throat> so in 1871, she marries Edward McDowell <laughs> on Valentine's Day. So there we see the romance and the drama and maybe uh, an unfortunate choice all coming together. And that is where the McDowell part of her whole name comes from. She marries Edward. And the next year, they have a baby, a little girl named Lillian. And the next year, they move to Texas. So now Edward was from a family that had some money in the pre-Civil War years. He set out the Civil War. Um, after the war, the family had less money. And so they were scrapping around to get some resources together. And he had an uncle who had a business in Texas, a store. And he went there to work in the store. But Edward McDowell seems to have been always looking for the main chance, the next big thing, a way to make some money pretty fast. And he got involved in a scheme to mine bat guano in Texas. So Kate said, so Kate came back. So Kate left Edward in Texas with the bats and she came back to Holly Springs. But I think when we see what happens next, we realize that she had a plan even then about what she wanted to do. And it wasn't just to get away from Edward. In September of that year, Kate leaves her baby with her in-laws. The child is just about a year old and she goes alone to Boston, Massachusetts to become a writer. So think about where we are here. It's 1873. You know that if in 1973 someone had done this, or if yesterday <laughs> I were a young mother and I said, I am leaving you with this child and I'm going off to pursue an ambition that is strictly my own, people would have talked, right? Right? Well, people talked a lot. People talked a lot about this. But she did it anyway. The first thing that she does when she gets there is she hunts up the man who had published her work in the Boston Plowman. And then she works her way toward the most famous man in American literature at this moment, the Dean of Letters, which is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. She writes him a letter, and here is the letter in its entirety, courtesy of the archives at Harvard University, which hold Longfellow's papers. Dear Mr. Longfellow, I am a Southern girl away from my home and friends. I've come here for mental discipline and study and to try to find out the meaning and the use of my life. It would be to me a great happiness and help if I might know you. May I come and see you, please? And if so, will you appoint a day and hour? With deep respect, Catherine Bonner. So we can see a couple of interesting things here in this letter. She never denies being a Southerner. She never tries to downplay that. In fact, it becomes kind of a calling card for her in 1870s Boston. It makes her a little bit unusual. She also is never terribly specific with people about what sort of Southerner she is. Now, during the Civil War, her family is very much in support of the Confederacy, and their, their feelings about that run deep. But she records in some letters occasionally being mistaken for a different kind of Southerner, a Southerner whose sympathies ran in the opposite direction and has come north in order to find her real people. And when that happens, she doesn't correct anybody. She just lets them think what they need to think in order for her to be comfortable where she is. So the Southern girl thing becomes part of her calling, calling card. We can see here too, I think, still that kind of restlessness that we saw in the journal trying to find out the meaning and the use of my life. And then just notice this with me for a minute. Here's how she signs that Catherine Bonner, no mention of McDowell. So this is the beginning of a movement away from her identity as a married woman who might ought to be at home doing the things people expect her to do and moving forward into a new identity. Longfellow answers her. She goes to visit him, and she becomes kind of his, uh, his amanuensis. I mean, he, she, she writes things for him. She does secretarial kind of work for him. She talks with him about her writing and about her aspirations. They have a very close relationship. That is clear from letters that we have surviving in the Longfellow archives.
The exact nature of this relationship caused a lot of talk in Boston, a lot of speculation. And I cannot answer many questions about that because I don't know. But um, the, the specter of indiscretion was certainly there. In fact, that's one of the main things that people have remembered about Sherwood Bonner when they have remembered her at all is this connection to Longfellow. So this is what the historical marker outside, uh, her, outside Cedarhurst says right now. Sherwood Bonner, put the McDowell in parentheses, she never really got away from it. Home of distinguished 19th century woman writer who pioneered in dialect stories, served as secretary and inspiration to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So what we have known about Sherwood Bonner is that she is a kind of footnote to the life of a more famous person. Now, from 1874 to 1875, Sherwood Bonner did something kind of unusual. She wrote travel letters that she sent back to a newspaper called the Memphis Avalanche. Now, later, she, I don't know where the Avalanche comes from. Later she, traveled, later, she traveled to Europe, and she wrote back to both the Avalanche and to the Boston Times. But what she does with her newspaper publication is kind of interesting and a little bit different. Now, there are lots of Northerners who are coming to the South to write about it in the post-Civil War period. Edward King, for example, in Scribner's writes a long series called The Great South that is eventually collected up into a book. Lots of people are doing that. They're coming to look at the South, they're coming to look at the people in the South, and all of that is a kind of curiosity that plays out really well in national publications. Bonner kind of flips this script, and so the letters that she sends back to the Memphis Daily Avalanche are letters where, in which she is describing seeing things in New England that she finds interesting and unusual sort of like a tourist, um, and someone who is bemused by what she is seeing. So let's look at one sample, and this is also on your handout. So Bonner's column in the Memphis Avalanche was called A Southern Correspondence, A Southern Girl's Experience of Life in New England, What a Bright, Educated, Witty, Lively, Snappy Young Woman Can Say on a Variety of Topics. I don't know if she chose that title, but it sounds like her, so I suspect she had something to do with it. The dateline here, the Moral Lighthouse. So here's what she writes. In the first letter, you get a sense of her sense of humor here and also of her kind of attitude toward the things that she is witnessing. I am a sort of rara avis and owe a certain social distinction to my southern birth, for which I am duly grateful as the conditions of success in the city are not easy of attainment. For the native Bostonian, there are three paths to glory. If his name be Quincy or Adams, nothing more is expected of him. His blue blood carries him through life with glory and straight to heaven when he dies, not a question being asked by the fisherman who keeps the golden keys when his card of introduction is handed in. Failing in the happy accident of birth, the candidate for Beacon Hill honors must write a book. This is easy. The man who can breathe Boston air and not write a book is either a fool or a phenomenon. One course remains to him should he miss fame in both these lines, he must be a reformer. Nothing must be too huge for him to tackle or too wild for him to advocate. So she's obviously making fun here of the people who are around her and she's doing this by winking at her southern audience at home. You know how these New Englanders are. She continued in this tone for many letters kind of reversing, the, re reversing who's looking at who here, so that she is the person who is looking at something unusual and, an interest, and interesting in these New Englanders. But as sometimes happens, a little taste of success leads to more and more, and you just get in a little bit of trouble when you cross the line. Here she is getting into trouble, which I believe is also on your handout. So first I have to say, she got invited to this thing called the Radical Club, which was a meeting of latter-day transcendentalists, uh, sometimes frequented by, by famous people that, whose names you would recognize, but primarily staffed by a group of women who were inviting people in to come and give talks. I mean, it was sort of uh, history as lunch, maybe, but in the 19th century. She probably, but it was exclusive, and she probably got her invitation from Longfellow. 
She then publishes this poem that is about her experience visiting the Radical Club. She publishes it anonymously, but it is quickly linked to her, and it turns out that New Englanders might have a lot of other things, but a sense of humor isn't one of them. <laughs> so here's what she, now when I read this, you listen, because this is going to be a familiar rhythm to you, okay? But, dear friends, I now must close of these radicals dispose, for I am sad and weary as I view their folly o'er, and their wild utopian dreaming and impractical scheming, for a sinful world's redeeming common sense flies out the door, and the long-drawn dissertations come to words and nothing more, only words and nothing more. So what is that? Po. It's Poe, and it's what, what poem is that? It's the raven, right? It's the same rhythm and rhyme scheme as the raven. <clears throat> it's, it, I mean, I picked out one stanza, but there are lots, <laughs> including one in which she compares Edna Dow Cheney, quite a well-respected transcendentalist figure who had been important in making changes in children's education. She compares Edna Dow Cheney's figure to a porpoise. Not, not, people were not, <laughs> people were not receptive. And they thought it was bad manners because Longfellow had invited her to this and then she sat around and made fun of everybody and published it. So this is the beginning of a kind of icing out of Bonner from Boston's literary society. She made it to the center with Longfellow and then gradually she's being pushed more and more to the edges as people start to distrust her. I mean, you know, you have her for lunch and you might end up in a rhyme. In 1878, she publishes the only novel that she is, manages to publish in her lifetime that is called Like Unto Like. It is a story that is set in a place kind of like Holly Springs, and it is set in the immediate post-war years. So it's one of the really uh, rare examples we have of fiction that is drawing on that immediate post-war period from the perspective of someone in the South. But 1878 turns out to be a difficult year for her. Whoops. Now... Yes, there we go. Um, both her father and her brother die in the yellow fever epidemic. So shortly after the success of the book, she finally got the thing that she wanted. She's a success as a writer. This great sadness comes into her life. Here are some examples of the, of the desperate situation that she finds herself in. The thing over here on the left is a note, and then here come, is a telegram, and then here comes back a check. She writes to Longfellow and says, there are desperate circumstances here, and I need some money. And she helps him, he, he helps her out. She's managed somehow to get through the fever line, probably through some connections that she has. Holly Springs, as you probably know, was really decimated by the fever, particularly in 78. So there would have been a military ring around the town, and she manages, she manages to get through. Things don't really improve with Edward ever, and so in 81, in 80 and 81, she's living in Illinois where it's easier to get a divorce, and she manages to do that. Things are really complicated on this front because Bonner's own sister had married Edward's brother, and so their families, I mean, you know, holidays, just think. Their families are really tangled up with each other. She gets a lot of advice not to do this, but she does it anyway. In 1883, she publishes a collection of stories, and we're going to look at some samples of those stories here in a few minutes. Oh, let me go back here just for a second. We're going to, we're going to do that now. We're going to look at those now. Before I show you these images, we're going to look at just quickly at three illustrations that go with stories from dialect tales. Before I do that, I want to say to you that these are images that we find objectionable in 2019. They help us think a little bit about what Bonner is doing in her moment, but their depictions of African-American bodies are, uh, are troublesome, to say the very least. So I'm going to warn you about that before we look here. This is the illustration to a story called Dr. Jex's Predicament. This is in 1880 and one of the stories that's collected in Dialect Tales. All three of the stories that we're going to look at are from Harper's Weekly, which suggests to us that Bonner is kind of making it. She's getting herself published in national periodicals where she wanted to be. But this story kind of encapsulates lots of those tensions that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk. So the way this, this is a, 
The, the person leaning out the window is an African-American man, and the person he's holding on to is a white man. The African-American man is sick, and the doctor has been sent for. The African-American man can't come down from where he is because of his girth. He can't get through that window. So the doctor has tried to get up to him, and in doing that has attracted the attention of this bull, which has chased him, and the, the African-American man and the white man are now in this embrace, and they're stuck. So Bonner intends this for comic effect. My suggestion, as I look at these stories from the vantage point of the 21st century, is that there are ways in which Bonner is using what she sees as humor to try to put her arms around the complexities and tensions of this moment when white Southerners and black Southerners are kind of stuck together in a way that they cannot necessarily see how to undo. The story resolves itself in, in ways that Bonner would have seen comical. But the butt of the joke, the butt of the joke in the story is this doctor who is uh, ultimately taken advantage of by everybody in the story. That's a theme. And remember the doctor father as we think about that. Here is another illustration to a story called Aunt Anarchy's Teeth. This is the kind of troublesome figure that I'm talking about. This is a kind of, in quotation marks, mammy sort of figure that was very popular in the 19th century. So that's deeply problematic. The way the story goes is that Aunt Anarchy is looking for a new set of false teeth. That's what she wants. And she's speaking in dialect. You can see that running across the bottom of the page. In order to get these teeth, though, and Anarchy has to fool the white doctor for whom, who is her employer into buying them for her. And she has to fool the African-American man whom she is supposed to be marrying in order to, um, this, it's a complicated story, but in order to get his buy-in on this. And in the end, she's the one who has what she wants. In the end, the closing line is, but I got the teeth and that's what I was after. So there's a way in which she's kind of working everybody in this story to get what she wants. Now, does that mean that Sherwood Bonner was thinking about the bridges between white and black womanhood in the postbellum South? I doubt it. I doubt it. I'd like to give her credit for that, but I doubt it. But there is a way in which those tensions are sort of held in the story, whether she knew that or not and unresolved in some ways. This is maybe the most interesting of these stories. This is 1882, a story called The Gentleman of Sarsar. So the actual illustration here depicts what happens. This man in the middle with the gun is the gentleman. He has come to town and he leaves town fleeced of all the money he has by the combination of forces that are framing him here in this illustration. These are Poor white people, this is a t he's come to collect a debt. So these are poor white people over here on the right, and the poor white people have leagued themselves with the African Americans in the community to, to lay out this elaborate ruse that ends up with a gentleman, the butt of the joke, and penniless. How much is Bonner thinking about the post-war world when she does this? Is this just something that's supposed to be funny? Or is there a way in which ultimately white male authority pays for its privilege? Uh, I don't know. I think we can see ways in which the structure of the story struggles to hold all of that in place. And that's one of the things I was trying to trace through in looking at her fiction, the complications like that that we see. In 1883, Sherwood Bonner came home to Holly Springs to die. She had breast cancer, she knew that, and she knew that there was not a way to get better. She's buried in the Holly Springs Cemetery. Until a few years ago, there was no tombstone. But the rector at the Episcopal Church in Holly Springs um, was responsible for putting that up. In 1884, one more book of tales comes out. It's not nearly as cohesive as the book that she organized herself from 83, but it's another chance to see some of her stories. And although it just makes kind of a good ending, and I'm not completely sure it's true, in a lot of the biographical information you can find about Sherwood Bonner, 
you will learn that according to, to those people, to, according to people who were in the room with her when she died, the last thing she said is why I have just begun to write, which I think is an indication, whether it's true or not, of the importance that authorship held for Bonner in her life, that it was the thing that mattered to her more than a lot of the conventional things people expected her to value. So she's a complicated figure that comes to us from a complicated moment, and for me anyway, her work has been worth revisiting. Now I'm going to just read the last little, the, the first little bit of the book, but I left it over there, so hang on. And then we'll be finished. This is going to constitute our summary, okay? In 1869, the rector of Christ Episcopal Church in Holly Springs, Mississippi, the Reverend J.T. Pickett, used the parish's official record for some personal notes. Among them, a list of members who had not communed since, since, since his appointment began in 1862. First on his list, Kate Bonner. Born in 1849, Kate might have stayed away from the altar rail for any number of reasons. But her diary from 1869 suggests a restless soul, impatient with the conformity church seemed to demand. Entries include observations such as, no church, thank heaven, and instead of theological reflections about her prospects for salvation, the diary contains gossipy references to conversations with friends, details of her trips to New Orleans and Mobile, and accounts of her flirtations, including her tumultuous relationship with Edward McDowell, the man whom she would marry in 1871 and divorce 10 years later. Most striking is the diary's wildly vacillating tone, ranging from avowals of deep love for Edward to resolutions to give him up entirely, punctuated by an introspection that suggests the young woman's odd sense of dislocation in small town postbellum Mississippi. Twice describing herself as a rudderless ship, first on her 20th birthday and later in comparison to two friends, Bonner records moments of dark abandon and reckless despair. Depressed in spirit because of my strange lack of interest in all things of earth. Why is it, why, why, that I am so hopelessly unhappy? I feel sometimes that I shall go mad. And rain in the afternoon, a great depression of the mental atmosphere. I shall become a maniac unless I can be separated from myself. Woven throughout her entries is a sense of indefinable longing that surely had something to do with the pull Bonner felt between conforming to the life laid out before her and the one she desired. On December 1st, she boldly wrote, I have thought much of my future and am determined, unless I marry, to carve out my fortune. I have decided to be an actress after hesitating for a long time in favor of a literary life. Yet she managed to do both, marry and have a professional life, not as an actress, but as a writer. Bonner's prophecy was not entirely wrong, however. She did act a number of roles, trying to find her part in a reconstituted American nation where the categories of her identity, white woman, southerner, female author, were very much in play. This book does what Bonner seems to have desired most. It takes her seriously as a writer whose work negotiates those various roles and mediates the contrary impulses of the moment in which she lived. Disorder, disruption, disease, queerness, miscegenation, and violence course always just beneath the surface of her fiction, threatening to spill over into and ruin more acceptable narratives of race and gender in the postbellum South. This book, this is a book about the uneasy relationships between the surfaces of Bonner's writing and their darker undersides, a tension often barely contained by the architect who may have set loose, particularly through her humor, even more than she anticipated. Bonner's moment, Reconstruction, has come in for considerable scholarly scrutiny at the 150th anniversary of the Civil War's end. But we have Bonner at a disadvantage. We know what happened next. We know that post-war violence and discord accelerated before opponents of racial equality at the polling place, in the courtroom, on public transportation, claimed victory with the support of no less an auspicious body than the U.S. Supreme Court. We know 
that shared governance between African American and white citizens, possible in parts of the South until nearly the end of the 19th century, eventually petered out to near complete political disfranchisement, underscored by a variety of Jim Crow practices, some plainly articulated, others cryptically enforced. We know that the U.S. South, by every political, economic, and social indicator used to measure success, lagged persistently behind until many in the region came to embrace difference as a kind of defensive exceptionalism. We know that the Civil Rights Movement came 100 years after the Civil War and changed the national context for African American citizens, underscoring in the process their still imperfectly realized civil rights and those of a variety of others, women, gay Americans, Native Americans, Latinx populations. We know that today's Black Lives Matter movement would not exist at all if all Americans felt, even now, that their citizenry were equal. But Sherwood Bonner died in July 1883, before the Civil Rights Act of 1875, forbidding racial discrimination in public accommodations, had even been ruled unconstitutional. This is a book that tries to see from the vantage point of that indeterminacy. As Gregory Downs and Kate Major suggest, we should leave Reconstruction behind as a structure and as a keyword in favor of terminology less pre-freighted with meaning. They speak of the world the war made as a more accurate accounting of post-Civil War America, encouraging scholars to take the transformative nature of the Civil War era as a question, not an assumption, to stand in the moment itself instead of looking back with the knowledge of what happened later. Sherwood Bonner is uniquely positioned to help us do just that, her work a jumbled response to a jumbled period in American life, her own life an often convoluted set of impulses, decisions, and circumstances that likewise depend upon the indeterminacy of her historical moment. Thank you. I am happy to, for us to have questions. Phil Donahue has the microphone. Yes, I'm doing my best to trot across the margins. Was Pierre, uh, I mean, uh, Bonner or Pierre of Thoreau or Walt Whitman? Yes, yeah. Um, Thoreau dies in 1862, so he, she, and so she never, I don't think she ever knew or met either of those people, but she was, yeah, she was in the world at the same time that they were, and experiencing, of course, Whitman, you know, lives long past the Civil War and writes about the Civil War, it becomes the, really the great haunting subject of much of his poetry, um, but he, you know, he would have been experiencing that in a diff from a different vantage point, but absolutely, they're in the world at the same time. What happened to her child? I'm so, I've lost, oh, there it is. What happened to her child? That's a good question. Um, Lillian did marry, and she had one child, and that child actually joined an order of Episcopal nuns and had no children, did not marry and had no children, so the line, the direct line, really stops right there. She was raised, after her mother died, she was raised by, um, primarily by an aunt, who had, and eventually Bonner goes back to Holly Springs. I mean, she, they let her back in. I mean, kind of. They let her back in, but nobody's ever happy with her. And at some point, she takes her child back to Boston with her and takes the aunt along as well. And that, and so they have a kind of a, a life there in Boston that she makes for Lillian. After she, after Bonner dies, then I think Lillian spends much of her time with the aunt. Bonner's own mother had, had, is already dead. Her father is dead. Um, she just has the one surviving sister, but the sister is married to the brother of the strange, you know, so that's complicated. Um, there, there, are some, there, are, there are many mysterious things around Sherwood Bonner's romances, and they're... Um, it's a figure that you might recognize from the Civil War, a, a man named Colton Green, who lived in Memphis. And it, uh, Colton Green ends up paying for a very nice education for Lillian. Um, 
And Colton Green ends up when it seems like Cedarhurst is going to be sold at auction because the family's completely out of money. He ends up buying that and kind of getting it back to the family. So there, there is a benefactor there, a shadowy benefactor that we don't know a lot about that helps Lillian get off to a good start in life. She does a little bit of writing of her own, but not much. And that's, that's about as much as I know about her. We know that Ida Wells Barnett fought racial violence and it ran her out of Mississippi. Yep. Besides or other than Sherwood Bonner, including slaves and freed slaves in her work, is there any evidence that she actually did speak out against the conditions? No, no, there is not. There is not. I'd like to, I'd like to say that there is, but there is not. Um, I think what we see in Bonner is something that we come to see later as well. She, in many ways, she would, would match our definition of a feminist. I mean, she, she believes that women should be able to do what they want to do, and we see that in her life. She agitates for the vote. She absolutely believes that women should be able to vote. She brings a, a fairly famous speaker, fairly famous suffragette to Elizabeth Avery Merriweather, who is... Uh, up in Memphis, she brings her to Holly Springs to give a talk about women in the vote. But I do not think that in Bonner's worldview, that right to participate in society as a full citizen, that that right that she seeks for herself as a white woman, I do not think in her mind that extends to African American people. I do not think so. Uh, I think one thing, I, th I think what we see a little bit in the story is her flirting with the possibility of African-American characters having interior lives, not just being flat, one-dimensional characters who serve a typical role in a story, but she'll get really close to that sometimes and then back off and stuff that character kind of back into the role they're supposed to play. There's a story uh, that I talk about a little bit in the book. There's a moment when a, um, a white woman and an African-American woman are alone in a cabin together and the black woman is sick. She's kind of out of her, and she's kind of out of her head, raving. And she jumps up from the bed and she grabs a knife and she comes after the white woman. And I think that is Bonner on some level recognizing that there's a kind of tension there that she ought to pay attention to and she gets that close to it, and then she walks away. And the woman is written off as delirious and hallucinating, not genuinely angry. So I think she's flirting with something that she never walks, she never walks all the way through that door. No. I was interested in your comment about the lack of uh, Southern authors who covered that period of a Reconstruction, and I wonder, uh, one comes to mind named Stribling, who is, uh, lived across in Tennessee, just across yep. from Florence, and the first of his trilogy, uh, which was called The Forge, I think pretty much was set during that period, and I, uh, I just wondered if you'd I think compared. You're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there. Th th that you're right. Yeah, I mean, Stribble, there are there are people who are writing about this period. Absolutely, there when we can and, and I sometimes teach a class about the literature of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and we read a lot of those folks. Um, there are just not lots of them, you know. A lot of the um, there's a lot of writing about the Civil War, and there's a lot of writing, uh, sort of plantation style fiction that comes in the late '70s and '80s. That's where we get. Joel Chandler Harris and Uncle Remus, Thomas Nelson Page, those kinds of plantation stories are coming a little later. It's that kind of weird moment of writing really about Reconstruction as it's happening that I see Bonner doing. But there, there's, you know, there are plenty of people around her to, to fill in and try to get an understanding of what this period looks like to, to white Southerners. And there are some African-American Southerners writing in this period. I mean, Charles Chestnut is someone that we might think about who actually... Uh, uses some similar kinds of strategies to Bonner in terms of humor and the way humor works in those stories, although it's always really clear in Charles Chestnut's writing 
who, who's been gotten the better of, much clearer than in Bonner. Are you a Stribling fan? I have copies of the trilogy. <laughs> well, that's, that's about what I could say, too, actually. I've read some of that first one, but I haven't read the whole trilogy. Yes, sir? Yes, ma'am. Early on, you mentioned several strong women that came from Holly Springs. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, a catalyst in that environment in Holly Springs, perhaps the school system or some other reason that there was that sort of an unusual occurrence? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's the book that someone, that's that next book that someone is going to write, and they'll be here for books and lunch, and you can ask them that. Um, but I think there may be a couple of plausible explanations. One thing I tried to do in the first real chapter of this book is go through and think about what Holly Springs, Mississippi, looks like as a town, to kind of take account of its pre-war wealth and to think about what it looked like in those years after the Civil War. Because Reconstruction is experienced differently for different people on the ground in different places. So experiencing Reconstruction in Memphis is very different from experiencing Reconstruction in small town Mississippi. So I was trying to kind of profile Holly Springs in those early pages. And one of the things that comes out of that is recognizing that in the pre-war years, Holly Springs had a big, had a large population and it had a big emphasis on education and there were schools for both boys and girls in Holly Springs, multiple schools. So there's a kind of emphasis on education there for sure and Bonner benefited from that. And that emphasis on education spills over into the post-war years. Now Ida B. Wells isn't going to the school, that she's not going to any school at all uh, initially, but almost immediately after the Civil War, we have the founding of Rust Co what becomes Rust College in Holly Springs, right? So an emphasis on African American education immediately becomes a part of that town. And Ida B. Wells and her mother, for a time, are enrolled in school together right after the Civil War. In, um, the institution was called Shaw then, and it becomes Rust College. So. I, I can't fully explain that. There's an emphasis on education in the air, kind of, and literally on the ground. But the number of, of strong female voices that come out of that situation, experiencing as they are those educational possibilities in different ways, does seem to me unusual and worthy of further study. I actually had one. Has Bonner's work, have the short stories been anthologized much? Were they ever included in? Not really. Now, so the Sherwood Bonner sampler that I showed you there on an early screen has a kind of wide ranging assortment of her work. But um, the book Dialect Tales, the book Swanee River Tales, those books have never been republished, reprinted. So if, you, if a person, they have been reprinted a few times, kind of on cheap paper and, and uh, you know, just, just literally reprinted. Um, the best site for kind of, for trying to find some of these kinds of things is at the University of North Carolina, actually. They have a document, DocuSouth, which is a, a big set of works from this period. And that's where I would go to read them in their original form with the original illustrations. Um, so it, it's not easy, it's not necessarily easy to encounter the stories in particular. The novel is available. We have copies of Reading Reconstruction, Sherwood Bonner and the Literature of the Post-Civil War South for sale over here, unlike the cheap fly-by-night print-on-demand. Print exactly. These are lovely, sturdy books that we'll be sturdy. happy to sell you. Katie McHugh will be glad to answer any further questions that you have. I hope that we see you all back here next week. Help me thank Katie for this program today. <laughs>